my wife came up with the title. <clears throat> okay. Senior citizen drives off the lot with a brand new convertible Corvette. Gets on a highway, 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. Wind blowing in his hair, the little bit of gray hair he has left, and he's feeling pretty good. And he looks in his rear view mirror, and there he sees a state trooper, lights flashing and siren blaring. He accelerates 90 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, 110 miles an hour. And then it dawns upon him, what am I doing? So he pulls over and waits for the officer to walk up to the car. A moment later, the trooper comes up to the vehicle and says, sir, looks at his watch and says, it's 3.30. I get off at 4 o'clock. If you can come up with a, an excuse for speeding that I've never heard before, I'll let you go. The old gentleman stopped and he thought and he said, years ago, my wife ran off with a state trooper and I thought you were trying to bring her back to me. <laughs> Have a good day, sir. As the trooper greeted him goodbye. Christian, what do you do if your spouse leaves? Moreover, what do you do, Christian, if she wants to return to you? Join me, please, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And there are a number of questions on marriage today that perhaps you've had in the back of your mind or maybe that are a forefront in your thinking because of what you're dealing with right now. That will be, I believe, answered today. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me read this block of text to you, beginning at verse 10, and then I'll culminate in verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, a wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? But as God is distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, the Corinthians had questions about celibacy and marriage. Father, perhaps many here today have questions about marriage and about divorce and about what happens if I'm married to someone who doesn't know the Lord, what should I do? And then, Father, what about the children? Lord, many ramifications to these things, and I pray that this text would become real to us today by your Spirit, that you would teach us the meaning of this text and how it applies to us today, I ask in Jesus' name. 
First of all, in verses 10 and 11, Paul is going to quote from Jesus, who had given some general, uh, if you will, principles about marriage. Verse 10, it says, Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. See, this is what Jesus spoke to. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Now, when I read that into English, that a wife is not to depart from her husband, it just sounds like she is not supposed to leave him. But the word that is used here is used in Matthew chapter 19 of divorce. The idea is a wife is not to divorce her husband. See, in Matthew 19, it says, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Let not man divorce. Verse 11. But even if she does depart, see, she's departing because she has divorced him, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. If she has divorced the husband, not on biblical grounds, she has two options according to what Jesus said. One is that she should remain unmarried, okay? If you have the separation, then remain unmarried. Or number two, be reconciled to your spouse. See, from the Lord's perspective, those people are still married, and therefore, they should either have a reconciliation or remain unmarried. Get this, everybody. Whenever you have any incidences in marriage, whenever there are troubles and whether there are trials, the heart of the Lord is always one thing, reconciliation. That's the nature of God. He wants to bring people back together, first of all in a relationship with him and then with one another. But you might be asking at this time, okay, are there any biblical grounds for divorce, right? Are there times where God or Jesus would say, it is fine to have a divorce in this situation? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19 and let's see how Jesus himself deals with that. Matthew chapter 19. So you turn to Matthew chapter 19, Jesus has just left Galilee, the northernmost region of Israel, and he goes down to Judea. And then a great multitude comes to him in verse 2. Now pick it up with me, please, in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him. And by the way, the word test implies to trip him up. They're not coming to him because they just want to see if he can pass the test, okay? It's not the concept of the docimos where you have a professor who has trained the students and now hands out the exam fully expecting that the students are going to pass. This is a test that is designed for failure. So they're testing him and they are saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? This is a setup question, by the way. There are two prevalent thoughts by two major rabbis in that time frame. One was essentially, if your wife burned a toast, you had the right to divorce her, okay? Men ruled in those days, you gotta get this right. So there was one rabbi essentially for just about any reason whatsoever, she's out of there. And then the other school of thought was, you could only divorce your spouse for sexual morality. If she cheated on you, in other words, then it would be fine to divorce that person. Can I tell you something about the Lord Jesus Christ? He doesn't really care about the opinions of men, nor should we. What does he do? He makes an appeal to scripture. And that's what we should do when we have to figure out in life what to do. And yeah, how many of us, come on, let's be honest, we're having a conversation even with another Christian and they go so often on a matter, well, I think, or, this is what maybe I would do without ever appealing to the scripture. We have an authoritative word from God that tells us how we should live. Why not look to it? Verses 4 through 6, pick it up in Matthew 19. Love Jesus. Jesus asks a question. He expects a yes answer. He says, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them? You give me those words, everybody. Male and female. Boy, this is such a, a goofy day in which we live, is it not? We have everybody who's trying to redefine marriage for us. Like they have the right to tell God who instituted marriage in the very beginning, this is now how it's going to be done. That's the day and age in which we live in. And by the way, the words for male and female are very distinct in the Greek. Male, speaking of gender, 
and female speaking about gender as well. They're not generic words. They're very specific words that are used by the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 5, and he said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And by the way, this goes back to Genesis 2. And uh, who were the parents of Adam and Eve? But yet Jesus, or God, back in Genesis 2, gives this statement. See, this is set for all mankind. Shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, that one flesh relationship. Let me just cover verse 6, and I want to give you some ideas that are very important for us to understand. So then, see those words, verse 6? It means conclusion from the Greek. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Let not man separate. Very important to understand this, my dear friends. God instituted marriage. It applies to saved and unsaved people alike. See, because today I'll listen to people and they'll go, well, you know, I wasn't a Christian back then, and I did this in my marriage, and I did that, and I ask you a simple question. Who designed marriage? God. To whom did you take those wedding vows to God, who are you going to be accountable to? To God. It doesn't matter whether you are a Christian or not. And people will cite 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. No, no. When you got married and you took your vows, you took them before God and the varied witnesses, and God holds you accountable for the things that you said because God is the one who has instituted marriage. What is marriage? People are even unclear about that today. Two things need to be involved for marriage. Number one, you need to have a covenant. There is a legal document, there is some legal recognition that two people are going to become one as husband and wife. It's always been that way. And then you have the consummation, which is the husband and wife coming together for that one flesh act. Jesus made a distinction between marriage and cohabitation. Remember in John chapter 4, and by the way, one of my favorite stories, I'll just throw this in the next in charge. The pastor was doing premarital counseling, and he wanted to give the couple a Bible. So, you know, if you give them a Bible, you've got to write something in the Bible so you can say something spiritual, right? It's not right to get a Bible without putting something spiritual in it. So the pastor goes, oh, I know the verse. It's perfect love cast out fear because fear has punishment. And that, by the way, is 1 John 4.18. Got to catch that little one. 1 John 4.18. Well, instead, the pastor wrote down John 4.18. John 4.18 is when Jesus was talking to the woman of Samaria, and he says to her, you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. Did everybody catch the distinction? Right? You have had five husbands. Five times. Get it, everybody. The woman had a covenant and consummation five separate times. But this last relationship is just cohabitation. There was no covenant. There was just a living together. That is not considered marriage from God's perspective. I've talked to numerous couples over the ages, and I've had one fellow, I can still picture his face. Well, pastor, we're living together, and in God's eyes, we're married. And I looked at him and said, buddy, you're not married. If you didn't go and get a marriage license, that's cohabitation. We call that fornication, and God is not pleased with it. He and I didn't have any conversations after that, but he got the truth, okay? Difference between marriage and just living together. God recognizes the difference between the two. So now you're going, well, what about, what about the divorce? What about... Why does that happen? Uh, can I tell you something? God's intent, it doesn't always wind up this way, but his intent has always been the same. One man and one woman for life. Sometimes you have death, right? So therefore, it's fine to remarry. But look at verses 7 and 8, because notice what the Pharisees throw in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said to him, why then did Moses, notice how they appeal to the law, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Referring back to Deuteronomy 24, in a particular instance, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Hmm. Whenever you have a divorce, you have sin. Now, it doesn't mean both parties have sinned, 
but it means somebody sinned because what is God designed? He has designed one man and he's designed one woman for life. Isn't that what the scriptures are teaching? Isn't that the model? Isn't that what he is laying out for all of us? Absolutely. But again, are there times that you can have a divorce that in God's eyes is just? Let's look at verse 9. And let me just say this to you before I cover verse 9. What many have done is they ignore verse 9. They'll say, but Genesis chapter 2 says, you know, one man, one woman for life. True, that's God's intent. Or they'll refer to Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 where it says, God hates divorce, and he does. But what happens when you have one of the partners in the marriage commit adultery? Let's look at this, verse 9. And I say to you, now I've got to give you a little bit of grammar here, and I know, I know you're excited about this. I know you came today and you said, Pastor, teach me about relative clauses. I know you have come in the door and you want to know about How many of you are just excited about a relative? Don't raise this thing. Okay. That's good. Notice the word. Notice the word here. This is important. Whoever. This is the start of the relative clause. And let me read you the entire relative clause and I'll explain why this is important in just a moment. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual morality and marries another commits adultery. That's the entire relative clause here. In the relative clause, you have two things, two major verbs that you need to notice. The first one is whoever divorces. That's that first verb you need to see, divorce. But then it's going to talk about remarries, see, and marries another. It's a package deal. In other words, if you divorce your spouse and it's not for sexual morality, and then you marry another, guess what? You are committing adultery. That is what the Bible teaches. Now, conversely, let's say you are a Christian and your spouse cheats on you, commits adultery. And by the way, let me be very specific here. It says, except for sexual morality. The Greek word is porneia. We get our English word pornography. That word is used of incest. That's how we saw it used in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It is used also of adultery. Very important to understand. It's used of adultery. It's also used of homosexuality. So let's say you are a Christian and your spouse goes out and cheats on you sexually. Jesus very explicitly says it is fine for you to divorce that person and then to remarry. But let me just point this out. He doesn't say you have to. You've got a book in the Old Testament by the name of Hosea. Remember Hosea? And he was a prophet. And he married a woman. What did she turn out to be later on? A harlot. She went out and cheated on him. And what did he do? He went back and he brought her to himself. The heart of God is always reconciliation. I've had on a very many occasions sit down and look across my desk at a couple where one had cheated on the other. And the goal has always been the same for me, reconciliation. And you try to work the people through what has happened. But understand, according to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, if that spouse goes out and commits adultery, you do have the right at that point to divorce that individual. And that is what Jesus is teaching here. Come with me now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We already saw the words of the Lord Jesus, but now Paul is going to give us additional revelation. He is going to give us information that was not previously covered by our Lord concerning divorce and remarriage. So now let's pick it up in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 12. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. See, Paul's saying, Jesus has given me additional revelation. You need to know this. If any brother, what does that imply, everybody? If it's a brother, he's a believer. And he has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him. Let him not divorce her. So in the Corinthian context, let's say Paul comes to town. Two unbelievers. The word of God is preached. The, the male believes in Christ and the wife does not, okay? What happens in that marriage situation? If the unsaved spouse is willing to live with the Christian, let her continue to live with you. That was your covenant. Come down to verse 13. And a woman, the woman here is a believer, who has a husband who does not believe, 
if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Now, the reason for this is given, and I trust this is what, if you will, rocks your world. I trust this is what will make a difference to you in your thinking in how you live. Because notice what verse 14 says. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. I'll explain that in a moment. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. The word sanctified is the root to be holy. Here I am, let's just say, I'm the believer. And my spouse is not a believer. If she was willing to continue to live with me, what does she have that so many other people don't have? And I'll tell you what, it is a witness. She has a child of God who is living with her who can model Christ specifically for her. Or if she's the believer and then you have the man who is not a believer and the unbelieving man is willing to stay with that believing woman, what do you have? I'll tell you what you have. A witness. Because the Holy Spirit is within that woman, although the husband does not know Christ. But what's the idea? To bring people into the light. Do you understand the importance of your Christian witness? Do you understand individually that we are to be lights in the world? And wherever we are at when we get saved, regardless what is going on, that we are to impact this world by being bright lights for Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that one? That is who we are called to be. Now let's go down the road a little further. Notice the second half of this verse, which I think is so very important. Otherwise, your children would be what? Unclean. But now they are holy. So you got a saved man, unsaved wife, and you have children. Why are those children truly blessed? I'll tell you why they are truly blessed. Because there is a believer in that home. And if you have a believer in that home, it is a witness to that child. So you have to let your light shine so that child will dr be drawn to the light instead of to the darkness. This is how we are called to live. And you know, and I hear so much these days about the blended family, right? Families that have come together who previously had experienced divorce, remarriage, and you know, you've got the whole thing going on. Regardless of your situation and regardless even if you're not married and you have a child, but you know God, you are a witness to that child and you are called to be a light to that child so that child can grow up and know the Lord. You've got to make your witness known to whomever is around you. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You have the Holy Spirit of God who is within you. And that was chapter 6. And as a result of being in you, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is within us. Wherever we go, we bring the light. Some of you come in hard circumstances. You've come through much. Some of you have come through busted marriages and busted families. I understand. That's the world in which we live. But how about today? How is your light shining today? Shining towards the unsafe spouse or shining towards those unsaved children. It is up to you, my friend, to make an impact in this world that people will see our lives and go, wow, I want what mom has. Or I want what dad has because there's just a brightness there. There is a godliness there. There is a Christ-likeness there that I have to have. That's what Paul's saying. The Corinthians had come out of a pagan situation. They knew busted families. They understood divorce. They understood the difficulties of raising children in a culture like that. It doesn't change. It's always a challenge. But Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the one who is to be manifest to the unsaved world. And I just ask you, dear friend, on a daily basis, on a momentary basis, are you someone who is brightly showing Christ? The world around you, and may I say your family around you, desperately needs this witness. But let's say, verse 15, you're a believer, and the unsaved person is not willing to stay with you. 
That's verse 15. Look at this with me. But if the unbeliever departs, catch the word depart here. It means divorce is you. Same word used in verse 10, Corinzo. Let him depart. That's the command. You can't stop them. If that unsaved person is going to walk away from the marriage, you can't physically restrain them. They're gone. Let him depart. But notice what Paul goes on to say. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. In other words, you are free to remarry. And can I tell you a concept here, everybody? Those Christians that I know that have been married to unsaved spouses, when that unsaved spouse generally bolts, there's someone else in mind. They generally don't walk away because they just want their singleness. They generally walk away because they've got some other little thing going on. And now we call that adultery. So don't think just abandonment. It's generally going to be abandonment with the pursuit of someone else, which is called adultery. And God says, in that case, the brother or sister is not under bondage. You are free to remarry because God has called us to peace. And zero in on verse 16 and think about your marriage. Think about what is going on in your own life. And this is so very crucial, verse 16. For how do you know a wife whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, oh husband, whether you will save your wife? See, if you walk away from that relationship or if you push the unsaved person away, how are you going to bring them to Christ? But if you are that bright light, if you are that shining example, maybe that person understands what Christianity is truly all about and is drawn in and someone is saved. That's what our desire should be. Can I encourage you, my friends, that are married Take your vow seriously. Take your vow seriously. Today, I listen to people and they talk about their weddings. What I'm going to wear. How big the bridal party is going to be. How big the reception is going to be. Man, there should be fear and trepidation. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, God says when you take a vow, you take it before God. Don't be a fool. You make sure you pay the vow that you take to God. Because God is going to hold you accountable for it. And by the way, that Christian wedding then becomes the model to everyone else of Christ's love for the church. It is a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture. Author and business leader Fred Smith writes, One of my treasured memories comes from a donut shop in Grand Saline, Texas. There was a young farm couple sitting at the table next to mine. He was wearing overalls and she a gingham dress. After finishing their donuts, he got up to pay the bill, and I noticed she didn't get up to follow him. But then he came back and stood in front of her. She put her arms around his neck, and he lifted her up, revealing that she was wearing a full body brace. He lifted her out of her chair and backed out the front door to the pickup truck with her hanging from his neck. As he gently put her into the truck, everybody in the shop watched. No one said anything until the waitress remarked almost reverently. He took his vows seriously. Isn't that right? For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. Till death do us part. My dear friends, in this day and age, people have looked down on marriage so quickly, contemptuously. They have been so quick to look down upon the sacred institution of what God has designed. Now, we have to take all these factors into mind, but never minimize marriage. Never minimize the importance of it. Never minimize when you take your vows before God, because whether it's 10 years out or 20 years out or 30 years out, God is going to hold you accountable for how you lived up to those vows. Having said all this, let me give you point number one. Pursue. That sounds like something you're actively to go out and do, right? Pursue a permanent marriage with godly children. I can't stress this strongly enough. This should be the pursuit. Now, it might not happen. You can't always control what that other person is going to do. You can't always control what your children are going to do, but you can control how you live, and you can control what you do, and you can control what you model. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 2. That's the uh, last book of the Old Testament, please. Malachi chapter 2. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. Not only do you need to have a godly marriage, if possible, but the goal should always be to raise godly children. Man, I listen, and education is the God of the, one of the gods of this age. Oh, if my child has an education, everybody will think I'm smart. 
or athleticism. Oh, if my child is a great athlete, everybody will recognize him and see really where he got all those or she got all those great abilities. You know what I'm talking about. We have Christian parents who are on task, if you will, to try to bring their children up for everything but godliness. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. Notice this. With whom you have dealt treacherously. Hmm. When you pick it all up and put it all together, you know what it sounds like in Malachi chapter 2? The man who was in control of his environment at that point has had his wife for a long time. And look at her. She goes, she's got an agent. And I got some money here. And there's a sweet young thing down there. And she's got her eye on me. And I think what I'm going to do is just, uh, if you will, put out the old and bring on the new. I, I know that doesn't happen in our culture, right? I, I know we never see anything like that around us whatsoever, right? That's what's going on here. Notice, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion. And notice what he says, and your wife by what? Covenant. Covenant. If we're not faithful in our wedding vows, why does anybody think we're going to be faithful in anything else that we do? Right? You can't help it if your spouse breaks his or her vows. That's on them. But it does matter what you do, and it does matter what you choose to live up to, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Once you make the commitment, God will give you the grace to do your part. Let's continue, verse 15. But did he not make them one? Going back to Adam and Eve. I love Genesis 2. I love to start my premarital counseling with people. I love to walk them through why God was so gracious to Adam and gave him that really foxy chick. You know, I mean, God was just good to the man. And Adam is just, you know, there, and he's giving names to all the animals, and the couples are brought to him, and he brings, God creates Eve, brings him to Adam. And, I mean, God doesn't give any instruction, no instruction there. He just goes, woo! I mean, that man must have been really excited at that time. Can you imagine the first woman that God created? No sin, no taint, nothing. Man, I think he was pretty happy. I'm just guessing here. Okay. Didn't he make them one? And then he gave them some beautiful instructions. Be, multi be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Man, there's nobody on the earth. I don't think Adam was going around going, I'm in the money. I think he was one happy man at that point, right? He was given an assignment by God. She was given an assignment by God. God came and met with them every day. They had this threesome thing going on, and it was beautiful. One flesh, the two became one. Notice, and he goes on to say in verse 15, and why one? Why did God take the two and make them one? Notice what he is seeking, and everybody, let your eyes look at the text. He seeks godly offspring. Got it? Yeah. Why does God create marriage? Intimacy. That's Genesis 2. You track the Hebrew words in the entire account, and God wanted a man and a woman to have a relationship like none other on planet Earth, intimacy. And then also to procreate, be fruitful, and multiply, right? And then he just wanted them to have fun. You read the book of Song of Solomon? God had created sex in order that the man and wife enjoy themselves in the right context, in the right place, with God looking on, nodding, and giving approval. Wow, all of that. This is what Almighty God has done. And I want you to contemplate that through this relationship, what is he going to do? It is that they might be a godly offspring. Look at me, parent. Look at me, parents. Look at me, parents. Look at me, parents-to-be. That's it right there. You got it? What do you want for your children? If you want to have a heart for God, godly offspring. Got it? Got it? That's what it's all about. I, you know, raising children, it doesn't matter to me how many degrees they had, and I'm very serious about that, although I think if you tally off the Burge family, we got like 16 of them. They add up after a while. God provided for them all. I didn't really care about the particular vocation. I'm serious about that. I just wanted a vocation God had created for them. That's the important thing is this, that they be godly, that they reflect the Lord Jesus Christ because all of us are called to reflect him. And can you imagine how many problems we have in life, maybe because that wasn't the goal? 
Can you imagine how many problems parents have endured because we have not had that as a chief ambition? And let me tell you something as a parent. When your kids are doing what's right and they're striving for godliness, it's a whole lot easier to parent. Do you know that? It's a whole lot easier to parent. God's goal, godly offspring. I don't care where you're at. I don't care what your situation is. This is what you need to understand, whether you are a parent or a parent-to-be. You purpose in your heart. Godly offspring, that's going to be the goal from day one. Align your heart with God's heart. And you know how that all begins? With a godly marriage. That's exactly right. And if you haven't had the marriage and you have the offspring, then you bring up that offspring and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and you do what is right. This is what the Bible says. Because notice in verse 16, everybody, and please understand this concept. Satan loves divorce because God had created marriage and he wanted one man and one woman for life. Verse 16, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. Is that clear enough? What does God think of divorce? He hates it. He hates it. Understand it. Some of you might have come from divorce situations, and you're under the blood of Christ, and he's forgiven you for it. It doesn't change the fact God still hates divorce. And we've got a whole world out here. I call it smoke and mirrors. You know, the Hollywood celebs showing you what the perfect marriage looks like and the perfect body looks like. And, you know, then they're married four or five years, and you know what? They've had the best fling on planet Earth, or so it seems, and it was just discard that one, let's pick up someone new. That doesn't happen all the time, does it? It's in the headlines every day. That's not the model. It's one man, one woman, godliness producing more godliness. That's God's heart. All right, turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So pursue a permanent marriage with godly children. And in number two, and this is our second principle for today, praise God wherever he's placed you. Praise God wherever he has placed you. In verses 17 through 24, there's a general principle. It's just simply this. Christians should be thankful for whichever station God has placed them in life. Wherever God has put you, you just say thank you. You know, some are born into slavery. Some are born free. Can you thank God for any situation that you have? Sure, when you know God, this is what it's all about. Look at verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, so let him live. And this is what I want to say to you today. I don't know what your past is, but where you are at today, accept it and then walk with God, whatever your condition. That's what the Bible says to you. I don't know, you might have blown it in the past, and some of you big time. Imagine a woman of Samaria. You have had five husbands, and the one you have is now not your husband. That lady had some past baggage, wouldn't you say? But she came to have a personal relationship with Christ and to have her sins forgiven, and she could pick it up, and she was rich because she knew Christ. In verses 18 and 19, see, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised when you're saved or uncircumcised. But what matters is the keeping of the word of God. That's what the end of verse 19 says. And now, once again, see, so we get the point in verse 20. Let each one, the command is remain in the same calling in which you were called. Let's get very specific here in 21 and 22. Were you called while a slave? That was Onesimus. Remember the book of Philemon? He's a slave. And yet, that is when he came to Christ. Notice it says, do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, most likely through the process of manumission, you know, paying for your freedom, use it. Verse 22, and I love the paradox. This is true. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. That's right. Onesimus, though a slave, came to know Christ. And what did Christ do? He made him free. But notice this. Likewise, he who is called while free is what? is Christ's slave. We've got a good master in Jesus Christ, and whatever he puts us, wherever he places us, we praise him and we just serve him there. Don't ever forget this in verse 23. You are priceless to God. How do I know that? Verse 23. You were bought at a price. That's right. Your salvation was costly. Jesus laid down his life because he loves you personally. That's awesome. But what does it say at the end of verse 23? Do not become slaves of men. 
Don't become enslaved to this world system. They have nothing to offer you. And then finally down here in verse 24, notice now for the third time this is repeated so that we get it. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. I have a statistic written down here. I won't go into it, but it's just sad. In 2010, a group of women uh, surveyed, would you give up personal time to make more money? Oh, yeah. In other words, would you sacrifice family in order that you could make more money? Oh, yeah. And what's happening as a result of that, ladies? I'll tell you what's happened as a result of that. Our children are going down the toilet because they need their mom. They need their dad. They don't need the extra iPod. They don't need the extra set of Nikes. They need their moms and dads. And don't let anybody ever tell you differently. They don't need more stuff. They need to have their parents who are nurturing them in the ways of God. To close this out, let's go back to Matthew 19 for just a moment. Can I show you how this works together with marriage and then with children? I want you to understand this. This is so vital. Satan has had a field day, my friends, in our country. Has he not? You look at the divorce rate. You look what's going on around our country. And... Families are in a shambles. They are. There is just a disintegration like we haven't seen perhaps before even even the history of our country. We should be greatly concerned. We've got our political leaders advocating now gay marriage. We have people saying what's wrong is right and what is right is wrong. And I'm going, who's going to turn it around? You going, you going to look to the politics? Do you really think the election in November is going to change the world's ills? Some of you, unfortunately, do. Yeah, I, you know what? I think you need to vote. You're a citizen. You have the privilege to do so. We should align with those who line up with God. I don't care if you're white, black, Hispanic, or Asian, and God forbid with any of you, when we just look on skin color and we make judgments on that, that just tells me something. If that's where you're at, take this to heart, you're shallow. You are shallow if you make judgments just based upon skin color. We're all one blood. That's what the Bible teaches us. We should have one heart, one heart for God. And what God says is right is right. And what God says is wrong is wrong. And when we do what is right, we please God. Amen. It's that simple. I pray that we develop that kind of heart. And you go, you don't know my past. You don't know my background. This I know. God saved you. He bought you out of the slave market like he did me. I was a servant to Satan, and I didn't even know it. He led me on a short leash. He walked me down the way. He told me what to do, and I did it. And Christ died to set me free. I have allegiance to him and him alone because he came down here to die for me. So when he says, do this, you do it. It's that simple. And in Matthew 19, as he talks about marriage, and I love the verses 4 through 6, God did something beautiful. He took Adam. He brought Eve. He said, now this is your spouse. You two are to be together for length of days. And almighty God himself came to meet with them daily. If you're single here, do not settle for a spouse who doesn't, number one, know the Lord. And number two, someone who also walks with God. You will never produce godly offspring unless you strive to have a godly marriage first. It is God's design. And if you will, with the leave and cleave, and I love it in Genesis chapter 2, you leave mother and father, it's abandonment in a sense, okay? And you cleave, it's to be stuck as glue to your spouse. You say, you know, the two are one, and they cannot be separated. That's God's intent, and it takes work, and it takes sacrifice, and it takes patience, and you're going to have to practice 1 Corinthians 13 on more than one occasion. Love suffers long and is kind. Go through the list. You know why? Because we're people. But now right after marriage, right after marriage, pick it up. This is no mistake. Verse 13. Matthew 19, 13. Then the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. In other words, the disciples thought Jesus didn't have enough time for the children. He had just talked about marriage. And what usually comes from marriage, everybody? Children. Okay. And they brought the children to Jesus. Because in that day, the rabbi would put his hands on a child or take him up in his arms and pronounce a blessing or pray over that child. And the disciples said, ah, he's too busy for that. 
Verse 14, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Mm, get it, get it. Godly marriages will help produce godly children. You got it? Bow your heads, close your eyes, talk to God. Come on, let's get serious at this moment. Christian spouse, how are you doing in your marriage? Is that the goal? Godly marriage? Are you doing your role according to what God has told you to do? If not, would you tell him I'm going to do it right now? I'm going to fulfill my vows, and I'm going to do what I've committed to do and be that Christian spouse. How about those of you who aren't married yet? Would you commit... Number one, to be that godly person individually, would you draw that circle around yourself right now and say, God, by your grace, if nobody else is holy and godly, I'm going to be. And God knows your past is under the blood of Christ. Leave it there. And then would you tell God right now, Father, I will pursue a godly marriage and I will pursue one day when you give us children that they be godly as well.